But it is time now for our featured interview with Olympian swimmer Mark Foster. This is where I talk to the biggest names in the world of politics, showbiz, sport, business and beyond. This week's guest is a man who was uh, one of Britain's all-time greatest swimmers. He's got six world championship titles, two Commonwealth titles and 11 European titles to his name. Uh, welcome. Welcome, Mark. I should also confess that we've known each other since we were about, well, I was about 15 years old. I remember you being, um, you had the, the sort of name of you were the bad boy of British swimming. Uh, I, was at, I was at one point, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were you 15, were. I was probably 16, 17 years of age then. Yeah. And I think it was, a, it, was, it was a time when, A, I was a kid, I was a teenager growing up. Yeah. Uh, and I think probably reflecting now something to do with because I knew I knew and not an early age but I knew sort of 15 16 I was slightly different and I think because I was because I knew I was gay mm. and I wasn't quite sure and what, I, I, I was afraid of what people might think of me I mm. thought well if I'm not necessarily bad I don't say bad boy but if I messed about if I was a naughty boy yes then people wouldn't see the real me. So yeah. I, think that's, I think that's where the, the naughty, where the bad boy bit came from. Yeah, you did. But also because you carried yourself with this sort of aloof arrogance, which you kind of now look back and you go, well, that's because you had your barriers up, right? Mm. You, were, you always had your, your protective screen up. You were one of the first athletes to have tattoos. Like uh, this, is, yeah. this is before <laughs> David Beckham made them very yeah. fashionable. And now, frankly, you're not allowed to play sport, it seems, unless you're covered in tattoos. You had the tattoos. You were, everybody said at the time, like, he is the most talented swimmer. And because you were, and we're a sprint front crawler, right? Mm -hmm. So that was the fastest sp fastest stroke in the pool. Once yeah. you dived in, you were a sprinter. You were the quickest man down the pool. And everyone said, oh, he's got all the talent, but he just doesn't work very hard, does he, Mark? If he just <laughs> put the hours in, he'd be so good. Yeah. Everyone Came had, easily. Everyone, everyone had their... I mean, I, I, was, I, was, I was blessed with speed, first yeah. of all. And then it was one of these situations whereby were, people were kind of like, oh, well, if you only worked a bit harder, you could do X, Y, and Z. And as a young kid... I did work a lot harder. I mean, I trained with Sarah Harcastle, who yeah. was, you know, 400 and 800 Olympic silver and bronze medalist in 1984. So I did 60, 80 kilometres a week, a lot of up and down the pool stuff, but I didn't get any quicker and I didn't keep going any longer. So speed was my thing. Mm. It happened to be the Blue Ribbon event. So the, I'm going to say the 100 metres of the track, the Usain Bolt of the track, that's the 50 metres freestyle of the pool. Um, so I was lucky I was in the glam event. Yeah. Um, and I do remember the tattoo thing was... Before the Commonwealth Games in 1986, you'll know these names, Jeff Stewart and Johnny Broughton. Yeah. The three of us hanging around together. We were the three naughty boys. Yeah. And uh, we all said to each other, if we, if we qualify for the Commonwealth Games, bearing in mind at this point I was 15, I said, we all said we'd have a tattoo. So we all went off. At 15? At 15. I know. My mum kills me still. <laughs> so basically we all trained in different parts of the country. I trained in Essex, Jeff was North London and Johnny was Leeds. So we qualified for the Commonwealth Games. We went home. We all had a tattoo and we got back together for a championship for the Commonwealth Games. And we all looked at each other's tattoos and mine looks like, mine looks like a Japanese rose. Johnny's looked like a squash fly because it was so small. And Jeff Stewart's <laughs> looked like a tomato plant. So we all did really well, really. And then eventually you got the Olympic rings, which everybody's seen. Because people like taking photographs of you, Mark, with no, with no clothes on. They like, used to, yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, oh, no. <laughs> There are some, some of us who still more. might quite like to. Um, but, you know, you always had this incredible physique. You what, six or six? Six, six, yeah. Six, six. And, of course, that, that was always your presence. You know, you looked amazing on, on the poolside. Um, you really turned it around, though, didn't you? You went from being distracted and not really focusing on your sport and all these coaches going, come on, Mark, pull your finger out, focus, focus, you mm -hmm. can be amazing. What happened? What changed? Um... Well, 1988 first Olympic, so 86 Commonwealth Games, 88 first Olympic Games. I came back from the Olympics. There was no money in the sport. Yeah. So it was kind of like it was a hobby. So to make ends meet, I worked as a career driver, fitted double glazing windows, uh, linesman, groundsman, did all sorts of bits and pieces. Uh, uh, and then I, I met someone. Mm. I met someone at the end of 91. Uh, I met a guy called Vincent. Uh, and we got together. We were together for 19 years. Um, but at that point, it kind of gave me a little bit of stability. And I think possibly at that point, well, actually, I know at that point, it was kind of like you mentioned back to, you know, I mentioned back to me being gay. I then found someone where I felt I could be myself. Mm. Whereas before it was kind of like I grew up in an environment in the late 70s, early 80s, where all I heard from the playground to the changing room to the TV was, you know, being gay was not normal. It wasn't allowed. Yeah. It wasn't allowed. It wasn't the right thing to do. So I kind of went, well, you know, where do I put this? Because I think I'm like this, but I'm not quite sure. Yeah. And then I was, all of a sudden I found someone where I was like, okay, this is, you know, it, 
if if being gay is wrong and but falling in love with someone's right, then where does that fit? So I, I, I kind of went, oh, well, I... I found somewhere I can be myself. See, none of us knew that. No. None of us knew that, even at the time, like people who were relatively close friends, and I was part of that group to some degree. You kept it quiet for so long. Now, why was that? What was it about being a sportsman then that meant you couldn't come out? And then what changed? I think a lot of that is down to, I'm going to say, showing weakness. It, although we know it's not a weakness, I think we, I'm so used to hearing the negative sides. So you're like, OK, well, that's a weakness. It wasn't Don't ma show it. macho. It wasn't masculine, masculine, masculine. right? And there was no one when I grew up that on TV that I kind of went, oh, okay, I'm like yeah. that person. I always felt like, well, I'm like, I'm like no one here. Yeah. So. Well, everybody that was on TV was just super camp. Yes. Right? And it was I, like Saturday night TV, Larry Grayson, and everyone had to be comp light on their feet. And you're not like that at all. No, no. But so, so, so I think what I found then was, okay, well, if I'm told it's so wrong, don't share it with other people because I was afraid of what their reactions are going to be. Don't share it because I was afraid of what sponsors might say. It was, it was kind of like the secret mm. became bigger. The longer it went on, the bigger the yeah. secret became. And, of course, when your secret becomes really, really big and you don't want to share it, it's almost like, you, oh, I don't want to open Pandora's box. So then I got so used to living two separate lives, mm. telling lies, um, and that it, became, it just became a habit after a while. And then, a cycle. And then, obviously, they put you onto Strictly. And you, were, you weren't out at that point publicly, were no. you? I remember thinking, because by that point I knew, and you, you told me one day, you said, you know, I'm, I'm telling you I'm gay, and I was like, well, thank God for that, because I tried to pull you so many times <laughs> you weren't interested. Um, <laughs> but I thought, if those sequins don't out him, nothing will, right? But then you go on to all the tabloid attention, yeah. you go on Strictly, right? And the spotlight is on you straight away. You must have known then it was inevitable. Um, yeah, I, no, I, I think I, coming from the sports world in a minority sport, it's kind of like you're only sort of looked upon once every four years. Yeah. So when it comes to the Olympic Games, it's like the spotlight's on you and then it's like, oh, swimming's gone again for another four years. Mm. So I kind of, I, I wasn't a premiership footballer. You know, I wasn't, in, 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 I, mean, I wasn't a heavyweight boxer. So I could kind of hide away beneath the surface a little bit. And then I just really come dancing. All of a sudden it was like, all right, now you're a fair game. Yeah which I didn't quite get because I'm like, well, I'm just doing a TV show. But all of a sudden, yeah. the tabloid press was interested. So like, now you're fair game. And I did. I got door stopped by News of the World and the Sun. Mm. When I just went on, I literally just started the show probably four weeks in or something. They, they, they door stopped me. Mm. So, and then at that point, it was also a little bit like, well, hang on, this is, this is my personal life. What's, what of interest is it to you? Mm. Uh, it should be on my terms. And then it triggered that whole... That little kid that was like, oh, don't, don't, you know, don't let anyone find out. So I kind of went back into, oh, let's, you know, I, I hid away again. And the only reason, literally, that I came out sort of four years ago, I say I came out, I was already out because people knew. Yeah. But out, out. In the public eye. In the eye, public eye. People didn't know. Which was when I heard things like certain countries around the world is still the death penalty. Yeah. Uh, even within the UK, people are still, be still beating up. And that's not just about being gay, that's about being different. Yeah. It can be the colour of your skin, it can be your sexuality. And I thought, well, I wasn't a tortured soul. I was in a very loving relationship. So if, if, if me coming out, that little 13-year-old, 10-year-old Mark, whatever it was, that kind of like felt he was different and could go, or oh, there's someone like me, mm. that, I can, that I could help someone else. And it but might be another know, part of the world, it could be anywhere. It's... It's, it's a very different landscape now, though, mm, isn't it? Things have changed an awful lot. What, if you were, do you think if you were a 15-year-old swimmer now, you'd be able to just be I think, gay I think, and be out? Yes. Yeah, I, I do. It's hard for me to say... So what's I, wrong with I, football? I, Premier League football uh, is still does it, does it just in the dark Does age? it come to the terraces? I don't know. The terraces are brutal. And then there's still, you know, we know how brutal people can be. And especially, I know I'm, I'm a season ticket holder at Spurs and I go to Spurs all the time. Yeah. But you kind of, it's amazing when you suddenly get a group of people together, quite normal, sane acting people, and you put them together and they become animals. I'm not saying everyone. Well, it's easy to it's think, groups. isn't it? It's easy to think those days are gone where people get beaten up for being gay. It's easy to think, you know what, the wheel has turned sufficiently. We have so many people now mm. who are out in the public eye. It's almost gone so far that it doesn't really matter anymore. We should be getting back to talking about character rather than getting back to talk about who people fancy. Mm. But then, you remind, then I think about football. Every time I think about that, I think about sport and football and the fact that it isn't normal yet. I, I, had, uh, I, I do a lot of speaking at the moment. I, do, I, I, do, I, mean, I have done for God, 15 years now. But anything from motivational, keynote speaking, diversity, my coming out, sorry, so, yeah. so to speak. And I was having a conversation with 500 people, and I was doing the questions at the end, and this lady at the front, who was from Holland, I believe she was, and she was like, well, you know, why is it a big deal? Why do you have to come out? 
She goes, I don't have to come out. I'm heterosexual. I don't come out to my friends or my family and say I'm a heterosexual. And I went, well, OK, well, that's good and I'm pleased. I said, but by you coming out as heterosexual, are you potentially going to get beaten up on the street? Are you potentially going to get um, attacked online or whatever it might be? Because there's people out there that do these things. And she went, no. And I said, well, that's why you don't come out. Because when someone comes out, and it yeah. won't, no, no, not necessarily just about being gay, there's lots of other things, as we know, within the LGBT plus community, uh, you kind of put yourself out there possibly to be targeted. Yeah. And, I, you know, I went through my career, and I think it's the thing, I swam, I qualified for the team at 15 years of age, I retired at 38. So I swam for 23 years. I love what I did, and I didn't want to be defined by my sexuality. It was more about my results. Mm. Now, did I continue and wasn't that good because I was, I was, I was constantly hiding away from, from, from myself? Mm. I don't know. And how's life now, then? Good. Yeah. yeah. Can't complain. Good. Yeah. I've retired at third... Well, I retired uh, 2008 after the Beijing Olympics. Did strictly come down. Well, you carried the flag at the Olympics, didn't you? Carried the flag at the opening ceremony, which was, mm. a, which was a huge... Huge, huge honour, mm. yeah. Walking into the Olympic Stadium with 85,000 people screaming and shouting was pretty cool. Um, but that was the highlight of the Olympics, my fifth Olympic Games. Then I retired and I kind of thought, what do I do next? Mm. And I did Strictly and then sort of other doors opened. I do believe that opportunity is sort of everywhere if you take it. Mm. And I sort of throw myself into things the way I did in sport, which is I kind of try and be the best that I can be. Yeah. Well, as long as I do things in a nice way, if you're a nice person, then yeah. Yeah, well, I think I think it's brilliant, Mark, that you that you talk about this stuff now, and you do it with such eloquence and kind of, as you say, I think what the what I've kind of when I've reflected on your life story quite a lot, I've thought about. I keep coming back to you as a as a troublesome 16, 17 mm. year old, and actually, if you talking about your journey helps other kids that are acting up right now because they can't be themselves to go, yeah. actually, I can be myself, mm. and it might stop some 15 year olds getting tattoos. I don't like tattoos, <laughs> as you know, and even if. Even even if that's what you do is stop the halt of tattoos, I, for one, would be very happy about that. Um, right, Mark, thank you so much. It's lovely Thanks to see you. Me.